Mapping Antarctica was difficult. It wasn't just the ever-changing shape of the ice shelves, the pack ice that circled the ships and threatened to sink them, and the difficulty in telling where the ice ended and the actual land began. It was also very foggy, meaning they often couldn't see the coast, meaning they couldn't tell what shape the land was. But on the other hand, they also couldn't see the stars, so they couldn't tell exactly where it was either. It was so difficult that five days after arriving, they sailed down what they thought was an unexplored channel, only to find a shipwreck. To my knowledge, the ship has never been identified, but it had been there for a long time. Before being frozen in, the expedition did make some discoveries, though. They found Antarctica's native grass and insects. Yes, there's native Antarctic grass and insects. Sensibly, the insects, the Belgica Antarctica, the Antarctic midge, lost the ability to fly in the heavy, icy winds of the continent. Rakovitsa, the Romanian zoologist, became interested in penguins, and concluded that the chinstrap penguins were capitalists and the Gentoo were communists. The chinstrap penguin is a strict individualist, quarrelling to defend its property, while the Gentoo is a shrewd communist, having nothing to defend against its fellow citizens, having shared their land, and having simplified the task of childbearing by establishing a communal nursery. The crew loved the Gantus, adopting three as pants. Two died almost immediately, but a third thrived for a time. They called him Bebe. Here's a shot of Amundsen trying to teach him to pull a sledge. It didn't work. The expedition photographer was Kirk, sporting a haircut seemingly inspired by an iceberg at this point in his life, and he took many of the earliest photographs of the continent. Amundsen and Cook hit it off, starting a friendship that would last the rest of their lives. Even decades later, when Amundsen was an international celebrity and Cook was rotting in jail, Amundsen would publicly go to see him. But then again, Amundsen was a man who gave very few fucks. Anyway, early in the expedition, Cook and Amundsen were part of an effort to climb a nearby mountain to try and get a better view of the coast for mapping. After nearly losing one of the team, Daguerrelet called the mission off, deciding that climbing a mountain made of ice and crevasses wasn't worth the risk. The thing is, the ship wasn't due back for about a week, so Amundsen and Cook decided to climb the mountain anyway, for fun. And they didn't bring the mapping equipment. They both almost died in the effort, each saving the other's life. When Amundsen got back to the ship, he wrote in his diary that he hoped for more such wonderful trips. He and Cook were birds of a crazy feather. During one of their trips together, their tent was shredded by the harsh icy winds, so the pair started drawing up plans for a superior Antarctic tent conical in shape to better deflect the winds. Amundsen would later use one of these tents when reaching the pole. And they really worked well, it was still standing a month later when Scott arrived. In February, a month after Winky's death, the Gerlach saw what he thought was a city on the edge of the ice. A city complete with a working lighthouse. They very quickly worked out that it was a mirage, a particular type of illusion called a Fata Morgana, where differences in hot and cold air distorts light and creates illusions. This sort of thing was quite common in the area, but worth bringing up, because this is one of the events that inspired a film called The Forbidden Quest. A fake documentary about the doomed fictional Hollandia expedition. It's a decent film. I might make a video where I talk about what was borrowed from what real-life expeditions. Anyway, at one point the ship was encircled by pack ice, but it wasn't frozen in yet, and they weren't exploring the surface on foot. This was dangerous, because though it was solid enough to ensnare the ship, there were still thin sections and holes, and falling into an ice hole in the pack is a very fast way to die. It's not just the cold that gets you, the pack ice is moving, so if you do fall in, the hole above you has already moved. You spend your last conscious moments battering at the ice. The Gerlach almost fell through the ice at one point, saved only by Cook's fast thinking and reflexes. Because of multiple delays in getting to Antarctica thanks to stops for science, running aground and the odd mutiny, they arrived late in the season. Winter was approaching and they'd not yet equaled the southern record of James Cook. Yes, that one. Let alone Ross and Crozier. They couldn't afford, literally, to add another year to the expedition. And by spending the winter in Australia, they'd be wasting precious time, paying people to do nothing, and have no way to raise more funds. Add to that the fact that polar narratives tend to sell better and generate more interest when there's extra danger involved, and Daguerrelak made a decision. Keep going south, and if they got frozen in, then they got frozen in. And they got frozen in. By the time it happened, they'd beaten Cook's record set in 1774, by only 20 miles. But they had explored further than anyone in this part of the continent. 
They hadn't planned for wintering Antarctica, they hadn't brought the supplies for it, they didn't have the food, and they only had enough serious, heavy-duty cold weather gear for four people. Not including Cook's personal skins that he brought from the Arctic. That leaves a lot of very cold people at all times. The only person who'd ever experienced a polar winter before was Cook, and he'd almost died. He was not happy. The only people who were were Daguerreac and Amundsen. Amundsen, who can usually be summed up with... Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? In order to avoid a mutiny, Daguerreac and Laponte told the crew that the ice was drifting north so they might yet escape. It was going south. The engines were kept warm to make a quick escape if the ice receded. At least that's what the crew were told. They were kept warm so they could go further south if they got the chance. Daguerreac even considered tampering with the ship's compasses to convince the crew that they were heading north. But it all came to nothing, they were soon stuck fast. One thing they didn't have enough of was coal, it was needed for the engine and to warm the ship, and if they ran out they'd be stuck even faster than they are. But Cook and one of the mechanics worked out an efficient way to supplement the coal with seal blubber. They'd collected the seals for taxidermy, science and samples, and they were going to come in handy. They also collected penguins. Seal hunting was difficult, they took multiple shots to kill, and once they made it to water they were impossible to catch. Penguins were much easier. They didn't have any fear of humans, and the crew eventually discovered that they liked the sound of the coronet. Van Mirlo, one of the sailors, would play it on the deck, and the penguins would come to investigate and be ambushed. One night, the southern lights were unusually spectacular, and Cook dragged his sleeping bag out on the ice to get a good view. It was late enough in the season that the hunting was totally dried up, and an excited crew member spotted him out in the ice. They mistook him for a seal and almost shot him. While frozen in, Cook drew up plans to go further south by manhauling to explore and hopefully not get lost on the way back. Amundsen, though, thought bigger. He suggested they leave together, go south, and not come back. That they stock up on seal and penguin and then kayak to Australia. It was a reason he was probably the first person to make it to both poles. The man was too crazy for mere ice to kill. Until, you know, he was killed by mere ice. But to be fair, there is a theory that was suicide. Side note, but when Amundsen vanished into the Arctic in his plane, Cook was asked if there's a chance that he could have survived his probable crash and still be out there, living on the ice in the roof of the world. And Cook thought it was possible. Anyway, back to the Belgica, the crew despised the food on board. It was almost exclusively canned, vaguely brown sludge that only kind of resembled what it was supposed to be. Canned food hadn't improved much since the Franklin Expedition's day. And to make matters worse, the replacement cook, Miss Schott, still couldn't cook. There were the seals and penguins, but the men refused to eat them. And there were fresh fish from ice holes, but as the temperature dropped and the long night approached, there was less and less. The expedition's comedian was Rakovica, quite apt, seeing as he looks like a vaudeville character. He lampooned the crew by drawing caricatures of them, or by drawing them with giant asses. And pulled practical jokes, replacing someone's lard for their bread with petroleum jelly, that kind of thing. You might wonder why they couldn't smell the difference, but petroleum jelly doesn't have a smell, and I'd remind you that almost 20 unwashed men were living in cramped Victorian conditions, with whale oil lamps running 24-7, burning a mix of coal and seal oil, and had a hold full of dead sea life. Not smelling stuff was a privilege. Regardless of what the documentary but Captain Scott said, the Antarctic was not the Great White Silence. It was loud. From ice creaking to carving as new icebergs are born from breaking off titanic ice shelves. And it wasn't white, not entirely. The ice would come in a variety of colours depending on conditions. For instance, pure, non-saltwater ice is bluish, saltwater ice is greenish, and various particles and even biological matter in the water can get frozen into the ice, creating other colours like red and yellow. Most ice only appears white because of snow. I think this might be why Herbert Ponting chose to heavily tint his film The Great White Silence, to evoke these colours. Though, to be fair, it was also the style at the time. The serious problems began with a long polar night. Months of darkness, no nearby animals, and some of the coldest temperatures that human beings have ever experienced. The cold in the Antarctic winter is so bad that people have had their sweat frozen and been unable to move. Teeth have shattered so hard that they shattered or even exploded. It gets so cold that warmer weather feels even colder, because it meant that there's moisture in the air. Luckily, the crew of the Belgica could mostly stay inside the ship. They had no hellish journey like that described by Apsi Cherry Gerard, 
or a death march like Scott, but crammed together in a tiny sliver of civilization in a dead sea of ice has its own challenges. <laughs>